Good morning and welcome to the ninth meeting of the committee in 2019. I'd like to remind members and the public to turn off mobile phones and any members using electronic devices to access committee papers should please ensure that these are turned to silent. Uh, we have received apologies today from Jamie Green, MSP. The first item of business on the agenda today is an evidence session on international <coughs> agreements. And I'd like to welcome to the meeting uh, Dr. Lauren de Bartels, Reader in International Law at the University of Cambridge, Dr. Holger Hester Mayer, Reader in International Dispute, Dispute Resolution at King's College London, and Ali Renison, Head of EU and Trade Policy at the Institute of Directors. Thank you very much for coming to give evidence to us today. Um, I'd like to start, um, given that we are seem to be looking uh, we're probably closer to no deal than we've ever been um, this morning. Um, and on the 13th of March, the government announced uh, a tariff scheme that will apply in the case of no deal. Um, and under this tariff scheme, um, there were newly announced tariffs on a non-discriminatory basis. Um, and my understanding is that the UK government chose to grant duty-free access to an additional range of products that didn't have uh, duty-free access before, including things like bicycles, cereals and shoes, um, irrespective of the goods' origins. Um, that will come as a bit of a surprise to people. Many people were quite surprised to know that, um, that it was possible to do this. Um, I wondered if you could, you know, share some of your knowledge on that particular topic and why, um, why the, the UK didn't just roll over these agreements and why they, they decided to slash these tariffs and, and what the effect might be on uh, manufacturers in this country. Um, so, the, uh, first of all, under WTO law, um, the UK has uh, made commitments, and these commitments are maximum tariffs, tariff bindings. So the UK can unilaterally lower those tariffs, but then it has to be done towards all WTO members, what is called most favoured nation, on a most favoured nation basis. Now, if we're looking at no deal, that means uh, the UK will no longer be entitled to give special treatment to the EU, or get special treatment from the EU because that has to be justified under a trade uh, agreement under Article 24 of the GUT. So uh, the UK is looking at a situation in which imports from the EU, if tariffs would remain as they are, would just become more expensive, which hurts the consumer and which also hurts industry because they, of course, use the input. Uh, so it is a, a rather rational emergency measure to say uh, we will lower tariffs. Of course, it has to be done on a consulted basis with industry and with consumer associations to, to understand where tariffs can be lowered because it will have a dual effect. First of all, of course, it's there to prevent prices from going up. But the other effect is that uh, there will be a lot more competition. So Chinese products can also enter at the same tariff rate and that is a risk uh, to UK industry. I see. Does anyone else want to come in on that? To add something on the legal front, and I'm sure Ali's got uh, lots to say on the um, business front. Just one additional point to what uh, Holger was saying. Um, there is another level which sits on top of the normal tariff um, rate, which is uh, what uh, you asked about and what Holger was talking about, which is uh, anti-dumping duties and in theory other types of so-called trade remedies, anti-subsidy duties as well. And the government has also said that it will continue to apply EU level anti-dumping duties on, I think it's 43, is that right? 43 products, uh, which is about a third of the others. And that comes after having done a review with consultations with UK industry. And essentially the idea is that there's no need for anti-dumping duties on products which are not made in the UK. Um, so that, uh, I don't know if that's 100% true, the outcome, but my understanding is that they took a fairly benevolent view in favour of UK industry concerns there. Um, and that covers, you know, products like steel and so on. So it's not just, um, you know, maintaining the EU tariff and then going down to zero on all the other products, um, but there's also anti-dumping on top of that. 
If I'm completely honest, at this stage, I think most of our members for whom this is business critical are quite happy to actually have the information um, and are still processing that to a certain extent. We know that you know we did a survey uh, not long before the decision was taken to try and gauge where opinion was. Um, and the priority balance was slightly more in favor of prioritizing uh, EU import flow. Uh, now, keeping in mind, obviously, that despite the fact that these new duties were, were slashed for the rest of the world, um, there is, I think, the figure, I'm not 100% if that's certain, is sort of about somewhere between 13 to 18 percent of products which had no uh, duty on it will now face it, obviously, um, uh, on products being brought into the EU. Um, but there is a concern, I think, about uh, the way in which it was handled, um, the process, and I think that that is probably coming out more vocally from the membership in terms of where their views are on tariffs is the length of time it took to get the information released. Um, and, and I think the other concern that they have looking forward is we have the information now, how long are the measures going to remain in place? What does temporary actually mean? Um, because I think from my perspective, the thing that you, the, the most common thread of consensus of, across lots of different sectors, which our organization represents, their concern is about multiple changes. Um, uh, and so the biggest question that we're getting now is less about what does this mean for my business, but more about when is it going to change again um, in six months or in 12 months again. So that's where I think the broadest consensus of concern is coming from rather than about the changes themselves. I see. So when you talked about the consultation, was there detailed consultation about uh, how the different goods were selected? I mean, because I would imagine that, you know, the, there might well be... Um, manufacturers who do make some of these goods in um, in the UK and they, they may only be one or two of them that they would be very hard hit. I'm just thinking about a, um, a manufacturer in my own constituency who, who makes a product which nobody else makes in, in the UK but there are lots of competitors from India but they wouldn't expect to feature very highly mm. in um, some of these discussions because they're just one manufacturer but it would devastate their business and devastate obviously the people that work for them. I mean what happens to people like that in the course of these kind of consultation? To answer your question about consultation, um, it depends on who you're speaking to. Uh, I think there is a general consensus across all business organizations, with the exception of potentially agri-food, because I think the Department for Environmental Food and Rural Affairs started the discussions a little bit earlier on. You, there was no widespread, extensive consultation that you would get when you have any kind of changes to tariffs um, in other countries, effectively. And I think that was the biggest issue that came out of the process. Um, it was very ad hoc. It was very belated. Um, and and to some extent, you know, there's very little engagement with businesses themselves. A lot of it was done, I think, belatedly through business organizations. But obviously, that hasn't left us a huge amount of time to actually go back, take what might be being proposed to the members and come back with feedback. So the process has been pretty woeful. Right. And in consultation, in the, the document by the Department of International Trade, the processes for making free trade agreements after the United Kingdom has left the European Union, um, it details this uh, the consultation of both the House of Commons and the House of Lords with a nod to the devolved administrations. I mean, in terms of things like these agreements, I don't recall any consultation with any parliament when, when the, something like that was decided. What, was there any political consultation? So, so uh, first of all, uh, as a matter of disclosure, uh, I work as specialist advisor for the House of Lords EU committee. Thank you for that. I cannot speak for them, though. I just speak in a private capacity. Uh -huh. um, I think this, the, the, the problem is there are so many processes going on at once that it's very difficult to, to, to generalize. Uh, the, uh, the tariff measures was a unilateral UK measure, so there was no other country involved. Uh, whereas the trade agreements are, of course, uh, a separate matter because there's another country involved. When it comes to trade agreements, you have to distinguish several types of processes. Uh, the first one is what is in the press generally called the rollover. There's no public international law term for rollover. It does not exist as a concept in public international law. But the idea is that the current agreements that the EU has will become UK agreements. Technically, after a no-deal scenario or post-transition period, this means signing new agreements. So under public international law, these are entirely new agreements. But the conceptualization that uh, the government had, at least from what I got from the press, uh, 
at the beginning was, this will continue exactly what we have at the moment. So I think the government probably did not see very much such a need for consultation. This came up in the trade bill discussions, uh, where people criticised it, and this is coming up again yeah, and again. I could just interrupt you. This announcement that they made on the 13th of March is not a continuation, and there was no consultation. And that, but that's also not an agreement, because you spoke about agreements, so I, was, right. okay. uh, I wanted to distinguish the two processes. Uh, but also with the con continuation agreements, there was very little consultation. referring to uh, the new scrutiny proposals, is yeah. that correct? Um, and I can't speak for either obviously the Scottish Parliament or any other devolved administration um, in terms of what consultation there was. Having said that, you know, we have, we are part of a, a, an alliance between both business groups, um, uh, st other stakeholders, trade union groups that has called for um, much more uh, improved uh, consultation and more involvement, quite frankly, of the devolved administrations beforehand, at least in the mandate, for example, for trade agreements. Um, but I don't think it's been sufficiently fleshed out very much at this point. Um, you know, I, I haven't read the entirety of the document. I can't remember. I don't think it necessarily references um, something that I think would be helpful, which is to maybe have something akin to what you have the Joint Ministerial Council for European negotiations. Potentially, you could have something along that line for trade as well, because there are examples in other countries. Nothing is a perfect precedent. Um, you know, there are trade-offs to the way in which you involve in Canada, the province, the provinces, the U.S., the states, for example. But you know, in certain other countries, you do have representatives of um, states or provinces actually outside of the negotiating room to a certain extent. Um, nothing is a perfect perfect model. There are, there are issues with something that is too prescriptive and, or, or not sufficiently flexible. Um, but you would expect to see uh, a much deeper set of scrutiny proposals before we actually embark on any new trade agreement at this stage. Um, and there is a big question mark, uh, I presume not only for the devolved administrations, but particularly for business and industry, um, about how the intersection going forward between the EU negotiations and third country negotiations is going to run. Um, because there's obviously a huge amount of overlap and one of the biggest issues we've found in the last, well, since the referendum really, um, is the uh, challenges that are posed at the moment to cross government um, policy, shall we say. Thank you very much. Just, um, uh, Dr. Hester Mayor, I, I know that you said that the, the announcement on the 13th of March wasn't a trade agreement as such, but, you know, given your, your role, um, uh, the close working in the Lords, were you aware of any consultation with the committees uh, of the, the Lords or the Commons on that uh, announcement? I, I wasn't, but, but then this would also not go through the procedure that I'm involved in. Um, right. I work on treaties, basically. Sure. Okay. Right. Thank you very much. Claire Baker. Uh, good morning. Um, can I just um, take you back to the comment you made earlier about China, about if, there was, um, if the tariffs were removed for European goods coming in, that would then open up the market to other countries, and, and you refer to China. Can you just explain to me how so we would have to give the same, because you said that we could only lower the tariffs, that would come within WTO rules. You couldn't do that exclusively for the EU, you'd have to treat everybody the same, so all goods from anywhere around the globe. Is that correct? Is that what so there's a principle in WTO law called most favoured nation principle, which means you have to treat all other WTO members alike. If you have lower tariffs, you use that same tariff rate for all WTO members. However, there are exceptions. One of the exceptions is if you have a trade agreement. That trade agreement comes with a couple of conditions, but you need a trade agreement in place. So currently, we do have a trade agreement with the EU. That's the EU treaties. And accordingly, the UK can treat the EU better than all other WTO members. In a no-deal scenario, that trade agreement falls away and there's no replacement. So there's no longer a justification to treat the EU better. So if we continue to impose the same tariffs that are imposed currently, we'd have to impose those tariffs on all EU goods coming in. If we decide to lower tariffs, that means we have to lower them for China, for, for all countries in the WTO at the same rate. So I would add... Uh better to <coughs> turn to my colleagues to judge the um, uh, 
feasibility of this, that, that there was a suggestion made by a recently departed trade minister uh, to the government uh, on the floor of the House about a month and a half ago, suggesting that to uh, try and deal with the um, Northern Ireland border issue, particularly under a no-deal scenario, um, that effectively that preference was continued to extend it, to be, continue to be extended to EU imports, which obviously would, would flout one of the most fundamental rules of the WTO, um, but that uh, his argument and rationale was that um, you could only deal with, you would only have to deal with the challenge um, for at least, you wouldn't have to deal with the challenge until 18 months. Um, I don't necessarily think that is government thinking, but um, I was rather concerned to see that that is something that is being discussed, but would probably turn to my colleagues to see how feasible that would have been. So, so it, it, the, it, that is more of an enforcement issue. That would basically say, let's just not respect this principle for a while and see what happens. And because the WTO dispute settlement mechanism takes a while, during that time, you just continue with the policy. It would be illegal, but because there's no remedy for past wrong in the WTO, you would just ignore the rule. You could try to uh, invoke exceptions. There's a national security exception, but uh, I, that would raise serious issues in the WTO. Um, can I just add to that? Um, I think the latest proposal on the Northern Irish border is to allow all products in without checks, regardless of whether they're from the EU or from other countries. Um, in fact, Holger and I have a different point of view on whether that is illegal under WTO law um, on one reading. So long as you treat all products equally, Chinese products and Irish products, at the Northern Irish border, in other words, you apply no duties to or checks to either of them, that's not necessarily an MFN violation because both sets of products are being treated equally there. Um, the way I see it is it's a question of whether there is a requirement to, for the UK to have a uniform policy on tariffs at all of its borders, and that's a separate question that precedes MFN. This is a bit of a technical issue at the end of the day. I think we probably would agree that national security should cover it if it comes to that. Um, but it's just a question of uh, how you look at it. I don't think it's necessarily an MFN issue. Okay, thank you. So if we fast forward, I don't know how long it's going to take and if we'll ever reach this stage, but to a stage where the UK is starting to negotiate um, new trade arrangements with other countries, primarily the US, um, Australia, China has already been mentioned. What, what kind of challenges are involved there? You're looking at the UK a small country looking to strike big trade deals with big economies, no longer part of an EU trading bloc. Um, how difficult or straightforward are those negotiations going to be? And I suppose on top of that, you're also dealing with, at the moment, we are aligned with the EU rules and regulations. Um, they are not the same as the US. And there's already been issues over, we're all familiar with the TTIP negotiations and the kind of problems that arise from those. Um, where do you see the future for the UK in terms of its regulatory partners? It would be difficult, I'd imagine it would be difficult for us to have a deal with the US unless we were to move away from the EU regulation regime. Can I kick off on that one? I mean, first of all, the UK is not a small country. Um, it's a big country, uh, and it's particularly big compared to my country, um, which is Australia, or New Zealand, or most other countries. I mean, there aren't that many countries that the UK is not bigger than if you think about it. I mean, economically, it ranks about six or seven. So it is a significant force in um, international uh, economics, really. That said, um, what does it mean for trade agreements? Well, I think you can distinguish between tariffs and regulations. Um, when it comes to tariffs, assuming that the UK is able to engage in trade negotiations um, and is not bound to the EU customs union, which, of course, would mean there's nothing to talk about, um, when it comes to tariffs, I think it would be a normal trade negotiation, and I don't really see why the UK would be in a particularly bad situation. Um, it's, a, it's a big country. Now, um, of course, if the UK has got rid of its tariffs uh, unilaterally, that means in negotiation terms there's nothing much to talk about. So that's an issue. But, of course, the UK has held on to a few others, and then the question will be, well, which ones will it negotiate away in exchange for market access into another country? Um, and what sort of market access as well. So um, that's one issue. When it comes to regulations, which was the second part of your question, I think this really kiboshes everything uh, that I've just said. Um, because 
trade negotiations, in reality, trade agreements, they are actually about tariffs, um, but they are also about services. There's a lot of effort that goes into negotiating regulations. It doesn't usually amount to anything um, in, in reality. So um, there's essentially countries say that they will talk about their domestic regulations and that they will reduce them in trade agreements, and countries never do. It just doesn't happen. So uh, you could say, well, the reason for that uh, from the UK's point of view is that it's bound to EU regulations. Uh, and that certainly, you know, if there is, let's say, some form of single market, Norway type arrangement, whatever, if you have that sort of thing, then that, formally speaking, stops the UK from doing anything. In reality, um, it's domestic pressure. Uh, it's very hard domestically to publicly go out and say you're going to reduce your regulatory space because of an international agreement. And so I think this is really going to um, mean that nothing much happens there, that probably if the US sees this as a condition of a, a TTIP type agreement with the UK that would stop that sort of agreement because the US really cares about that sort of thing. Most countries don't really care about that sort of thing because they accept that when it comes to changes in domestic regulation, you can't expect anything, uh, nothing much is going to happen and they'd rather just talk about whatever tariffs are there. I think uh, I want to make two points. The first one is, to some extent, we are already engaged in negotiating new agreements. I know that uh, the government says that the current arrangements are we're trying to roll over existing agreements. But when you look at an agreement uh, like the one with Norway, our current arrangement with Norway is based on the EEA. As all of that EU-type regulation will fall away, whatever comes after will be different. So this is already a new agreement to a large extent. It might be copy-paste with some regards, but it's going to be new in other respects. I think uh, I agree with uh, almost everything, of course, that Lawrence said. I would add one point. Um, what makes a difference in terms of leaving the EU, the, the, there are th two, soon three, uh, trading powers in the world that have the power to push through their regulatory models to some extent. That's the US, first of all, the EU, and uh, China will join them eventually. And you can see how they push through the model, for example, in the CETA negotiation. That's the negotiations with Canada. Canada is, of course, a federal state, so there are things that the federal government cannot offer. For example, government procurement in the provinces. The EU pushed and ultimately achieved for the provinces to be at the table to get agreement on that. These sort of structural changes in how negotiations are done and how regulation is drafted, I don't think is something that the UK can aim for because the market is too small to some extent uh, for that. Uh, however, uh, a normal uh, trade agreement, very much possible. Uh, I think uh, there has to be some realism in, in what those trade agreements do because there's a lot of talk about free trade and services, but free trade and services means committing your regulation. And before we start thinking about opening the markets of others, we'll have to reflect, do we actually want to be bound? Because we seemed to have a problem when it came to the EU in being bound as to when it comes to regulation. If we want to open services market, the same will happen in a free trade agreement. Do we actually want that? What do we want? Quickly, um, I don't want to uh, take up Ali's space, but uh, I think CETA, the agreement with Canada between Canada and the EU, is a is a good lesson in fact. Because if you have a look at that agreement, when it comes to changes in domestic re regulation, there's nothing. I mean, there's literally a blank page which says to be discussed. So, um, as between the EU and a, a fairly big player like Canada, it's a, a good example of what I was saying. It just doesn't happen. Um, there. Uh, is, of course, uh, a difference when it comes to countries within the EU's regulatory orbit. Those are countries that, by and large, like to align with the EU. So we're talking about you know, Eastern Partnership uh, countries, Ukraine, Georgia, Moldova, etc., and uh, you know, in some smaller sectors, Israel. But I don't think that that's uh, a common experience. Um, uh, when it comes to services, of course, I agree with what Holger has said. It's one of those areas everybody talks about a lot. It's very hard to identify areas where anything has actually changed. Uh, in the Korea Agreement, famously, uh, there was a little bit of a market access opening for law firms, um, which meant that uh, you know a UK law firm, uh, actually one that I work for, was able to set up there and get first mover advantage. But this is one of the you know, very, very small examples that anybody can point to where there was any market access opening under a free trade 
uh, agreement. I would say that where you really do see value in free trade agreements, aside from you know, basically, like in the 19th century, reducing tariffs. That's still the guts of any negotiation. Uh, where you see value is opening up government procurement markets. Um, there is a lot that is uh, of value there. And as Holger was indicating, it's in that area where you need, uh, in federal systems, you need the engagement of devolved administration simply because they control money and they control procurement. I, I, having worked from, from a business organization perspective um, on the TTIP negotiations, <clears throat> I don't see any reason why at a superficial and macro level doing a trade agreement with America is any less desirable. Having said that, um, I think that you know there is maybe slightly more reason to question the impetus or the need because um, the, the degree to which, and, and I'm not, I'm not um, making an, a, an, a sort of an argument to say that the UK is completely open to competition, but there are more closed markets, I suppose you could say, in the EU um, uh, than the UK for the US market. Now, the US market is still very closed in many areas, procurement, particularly at a, at a sub-federal level. Um, it's a question about ambition. So, you know, uh, you know, the UK completely reserves the right to not put certain things on the table. Or, for example, I mean, when we talk about um, the famous kind of issues around agri-food, you know, it really depends. It's not sort of co-opting the US's rules. It's what do you allow in that you're not currently allowing, uh, whether it's because of our own desired um, preferences or because it's a function of EU law. So if you look at, for example, um, the, the hormone treatment of cattle, uh, that is currently allowed for the imports of dairy into the EU, but not for beef. Um, and so there was a question mark about to what extent the UK does want to put that uh, on the table, so to speak, to allow those imports in. And I know that there is a discussion going on on the agricultural bill in the House of Commons about requiring certain standards um, for all imports. Um, now, some of those are legitimate. Some of those could be construed as you know, standards or can be used as for protectionist purposes to a certain extent. Um, but it's a question of, of how what your ambition is. Um, you know, the EU and the US... Uh, one of the reasons for TTIP, I think, was really to try and um, put a basket of issues in one place that hadn't been resolved over the period of sort of 10 to 20 years. Um, you could also argue that to some extent they failed because you had two massive power blocks. So there are pluses and minuses to um, having people who are in different sort of competitive strengths, shall we say, or different, different market sizes. Um, I don't think I would necessarily have picked the US as my first priority for US trade agreement, for a UK trade agreement, simply because I think it's quite important to get some experience under your belt. Mm -hmm. And to some extent, you know, it, 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 um, it, it forces in certain areas, I suppose you could say, choices between uh, alignment in the EU and alignment in the US. Although I would say that to some extent, you know, if you were, and, and I'm, I'm massively simplifying here, and, and my colleagues can disagree with me um, as they see fit, but to some extent, if you were to cap, sort of characterize the difference between how, what the EU does through its trade agreements and what the US does, I think the US tends to focus a lot more on enforcement, um, particularly on intellectual property rights through its trade agreements. The EU, I think, could be argued to export more of its standards. So I actually think that the EU tries to um, get other places in the world to adopt its standards. However, sometimes the way in which the U.S. pursues enforcements, particularly in the intellectual property space, can amount to effectively a country having to change some of its rules around patent terms, for example, the, 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 the length of time. That was something uh, that the Canadians are going to have to change um, as a result of the new changes to the NAFTA agreement. Okay, thank you. Ross Greer followed by Tavish Scott. Thanks, Convener. I'd like to uh, just stick with this point from and drill down slightly further. Um, as Lorraine's already said, most trade negotiations are about tariffs and regulations. Sometimes it's a little bit more political. So for the EU to progress its uh, arrangements with Morocco, it has essentially recognized the occupied Western Sahara as part of Morocco, at least for economic <coughs> purposes. But if we were to look at the economic powers that are larger than ourselves, so taking on board Laurent's point that the UK, even outside the EU, is still a large trading power, to take the US and China if, we, if we're in the situation of a no-deal Brexit and they see the, the, the US in particular sees the, the opportunity for the points I was just made around it perhaps being an unusual choice for the UK to prioritise the US so quickly, what, what would their priorities be in trade negotiations after a no-deal? And what incentive would they have to speed that process up? If we are in that situation where tariffs have been dramatically lowered or in some cases removed, what incentive is there for large trading blocks, large economic powers to actually progress negotiations quickly? Can I 
kick off, probably all got things to say about this one. Um, I mean, the US has made its negotiation aims public uh, when it comes to the UK, and they're uh, similar to the US's aims when it comes to other countries as well. Um, let me just pick a few examples um, that are of, uh, uh, say, political salience. Um, uh, there'd obviously be a desire to reduce tariffs on normal products, which would affect producers of those products, but you know, wouldn't have wider um, policy implications beyond that. Um, it's well known that the US would like to be able to sell um, services that are currently provided by the NHS. Um, there are obviously economic arguments in favour of that in terms of consumer choice and so on, and there are obviously public policy arguments against that, and that's a very hotly debated issue. So far, the UK's approach when it comes to the NHS is to ring-fence it. Of course, the NHS comprises many, many different types of services. Uh, cafeteria services are different from, you know, brain surgeon services, um, usually, hopefully, anyway. Um, so, uh, you know, one has to distinguish a little bit what one means by NHS services. Uh, and in fact, the UK has made commitments when it comes to midwives and so on. I mean, there is some flexibility there already. But that's clearly one issue. And I think that that is something that may well be on the table. Um, another area is to do with food safety standards. It's another big deal. Uh, the US has said publicly that it would like to be able to sell its beef into the UK. It's no um, secret that uh, that beef that it's talking about is beef that's produced by uh, artificial growth hormones. Um, the thing to say about that, it's not exactly as, and then with the chlorinated chickens is another example, right? The thing to say about that is that free trade agreements, when they deal with these sorts of issues, they essentially replicate the rules that are already there um, in the WTO. Sometimes they add a bit of detail, a bit of flavour, let's say, but they don't change the fundamental predicate of trade regulation in the area of food safety, and that is that you can protect food safety so long as it's based on science. Now, the US uh, argument on this is that current EU standards on food safety are actually not based on science. They're based on what the US says is an inappropriate application of the precautionary principle. So um, this is just, a, let's say, a negotiation version of what the US could probably argue in dispute settlement at the WTO today. And in fact, when it came to the chlorinated chicken and the hormone beef, it argued this, and when it came to the hormone beef, it won. With the chlorinated chickens, it actually pulled the case for reasons that I, I don't know. But with hormone beef, it actually won the case. There was no science the EU could adduce to say that its restrictive measures are, are valid, and that's been fought out in retaliation for the last, what is it now, 20 years, I think. So these are two areas where um, I think you can analyse them a little bit differently, or three. I mean, to start at the beginning, there's the tariff, normal tariff-type negotiation, which is nothing special. Secondly, there's going to be um, uh, an effort by the US to chip away at the NHS and other types of services uh, where I think there is a policy decision that needs to be made. And thirdly, there's, there's a lot of, obviously, this turns up in the newspapers a lot, arguments about um, food safety. And I think what's sometimes overlooked there is that ultimately the rule there is can you justify it based on science? I just want to pick up the second part of your question um, and apologies if I'm not answering it correctly, but in terms of the point about what could be done or what could speed up some of these decisions, I would keep a very close eye, uh, particularly under a no-deal scenario, on whether um, uh, Lauren referred to the, the EU having lost that case, for lack of a better word, um, uh, at, at the WTO. Now, that was... Um, temporarily, because I think it's now up for review actually, dealt with by the EU uh, agreeing to increase its quota for non-hormone treated beef coming from the US. Having said that, um, it would be interesting to see whether the, you know, when it is technically under no continued obligement to follow EU regulations relating to um, uh, the single market in particular, um, if the UK decides to continue with most of those rules and regulations, whether the US wants to also bring a, um, uh, a case against the UK as well. Um, now, there are other countries that have similar bans in place, um, uh, slightly different reasons. You know, Switzerland technically has similar ban but allows labeling. There is a labeling sort of choice almost to a certain extent to allow some of these products in in the US, but there are other countries that ban ractopamine, for example, which is one of the big things that you that the US um, uh, farmers feed their cattle. Um, 
and the EU hasn't ne the US necessarily hasn't hasn't necessarily pursued them at the WTO. So it's 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 hard to tell whether that is a, just a function of market size or whether that the, you know that is certainly beyond tariffs and big offensive interests that the UK the EU the US will have, particularly since I think there is a political view that it judges the EU UK to have a slightly different approach to the precautionary principle um, uh, as the rest of the EU. That's not necessarily the case, but I think there is a view that, that the US has the UK has a slightly different view towards how science is used in that kind of regulation than the EU does. So it'll be, a, um, particularly if tariffs aren't able to be on the table or on the table to the extent that the US would like it to be, that will be a big, big offensive interest. I would like to add, because we didn't have enough areas yet, I would like to add two more. Um, one is uh, pharmaceutical prices. The American pharmaceutical industry has long, and, and the American government has long thought that it unfairly pays much higher prices than everyone else because it finances research. And then other countries get to live of that research but get low pharmaceutical prices. So there's a, a, a push for having, a, in, from the point of view of the US, fairer situation, usually done through IP law, but also to prevent price comparisons, effectiveness studies, and those things. And uh, the UK has always been a model in this regard. Uh, and uh, that would certainly, for the pharmaceutical industry, destroying this model, because UK prices are used as reference prices in other countries, would be an enormous win. So you can expect to push there. Uh, GMO is, of course, another area we, where you can expect to foot. Data, data flows are a big uh, thing. Uh, the European model for data protection. The Europe tries to export that model, whereas the US opposes that model. Uh, GI protection, the protection of geographical indications, that's had long been a dispute between continental Europe, which protects geographical indications of origin, and the US and the New World that opposes them. And I think this also answers to some extent your other question, what is the interest in, what would be the interest for the US to push this quickly? Currently, the UK is also negotiating with the EU. It is not unlikely that these negotiations will lock in these policies. So if the US pushes now and can achieve agreement now on these issues, that would, of course, disrupt the EU negotiations, but it would be another country won over for a UK model, for a US model. I, I just want to just very briefly put on the record in terms of we have asked our own membership in terms of where the balance of priorities lie and I think it was about 62% think that the EU is the most important to prioritize <coughs> compared to about 13 to 14% looking at third countries. So we know at least where the bulk of the membership's focus is if it, if it became an either or choice. Thank you. You okay? <laughs> Come back later if you need to move on. Right. Well, I'm, I'm told that we have a little bit of time but if you could keep your answers as brief as possible so that I can get as many members in. In that case, I, this is probably primarily for, for Laurent um, around uh, w, WTO uh, disputes. My understanding is that the WTO's Court of Appeals is dangerously close to running out of a sufficient number of judges to actually make any decisions. Um, is there a danger that, that that event could occur in the next two to three years where the UK is in the depths of uh, a post-no-deal crisis? Um, it's going to happen on the 10th of December this year. Right. Uh, that's a, a cliff edge, um, and it shows no sign of um, being overcome. Now, that isn't necessarily the end of dispute settlement in the WTO. Um, there are workarounds, so uh, disputing countries still have the first level, the panel level, um, available to them. The question is what happens at the end of that? The problem with the appellate body disappearing, if it does, is that you have a right to appeal. And so if you don't want to play ball, you just say, well, I can't exercise my right to appeal, and then everything just stops. But it's possible to work around that by agreeing before the dispute that you will set up a separate appellate organization. There are proposals for that. So you can play the game if you want. Ultimately, most countries seem to want to. Um, the real question is what happens if you've got a dispute with the US and the US sits on its hands and says, well, uh, no appeal, we're not doing anything. Of course, the US is just as frequently a complainant. So um, we'll just see what happens there. Nobody really knows. Thanks. Thank you. Tavish Scott. Um, Ali Ransom, you just said, and I thank goodness you did say this, that uh, your membership's saying that 
um, our trade arrangements, uh, British businesses' trade arrangements with the EU and continuing those are more important than any third party agreement. Has the government, the UK government, recognised that point? Do you think that point has got into the minds of those ministers responsible for this? Uh, I think it depends on the minister. Um, I, I, I think it will, it, it's. The jury is out because the, the, it, the, the real test case will be when we are in the next phase of negotiations to see how that interaction between third country negotiations and the department responsible for that and the department that we assume is continuing DEXU for, 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 for Brexit negotiations, for future trade relationship negotiations intersect. Um, you know, I, I think, for example, the uh, to some extent, you have to also make allowances for the fact that DIT have no really um, remit to handle e-negotiations. So almost by default, they have to focus on the rest of the world to a certain extent. Um, there is a concern about some of the interplay between that in the future, uh, which is why, you know... It, which is a big assumption to make, but assuming we get on to that next stage um, in the next couple of months, it's really important to, for all of the focus on, on um, doing this speedily, taking time. I know the Prime Minister has made a commitment, I don't know if it will stand once we're in that phase, to consult par at least the Westminster Parliament more about um, the, the mandate, I think she said, for the future trade relationship negotiations. But I think the point that we're also repeatedly trying to make to um, the Department for International Trade and other parts of government is there's a lot that you can do with third countries that does not have to go into the trade policy or the trade agreement bucket. In fact, to some extent, the more you put in there, the more you're holding other things hostage to agriculture, for an example. So if you look at something like digital trade, um, uh, financial services cooperation, so the financial services industry in the US and the UK are very enthusiastic about the idea of a trade agreement um, or some kind of other mechanism to foster the cooperation that you really, the previous US administration, basically the Treasury Department's shut down because uh, they were worried about this leading to, regulators in the US don't like particularly financial services regulators don't like those things being discussed in trade negotiations. Um, to answer your question more fully uh, and to conclude, um, I think they are, you know, the priority that's been accorded to the EU negotiations so far um, proves that, that, that they are thinking about it, but I think it will be a real big test once we're actually out of the EU um, and trying to compete between negotiations. Do you have any sense of the capacity within government to do this? Because we've repeatedly been told that you know this is a country who've always have, has for the last 40 years, 50 years relied on the European Union to negotiate internationally. What do you sense in terms of businesses' views about about that well, about I mean, civil service capacity? Capacity is a concern, no matter who you speak to. Um, but I wouldn't say one that shouldn't be gauged through any numerical lens. Um, you know, uh, I think the U.S. Trade Representative's Office has around 200 people, so you don't need to go hiring thousands of people to deal with this. Um, and to some extent, I, I'm, I'm hoping that the negotiators will be really cutting their teeth on the rollovers, or what they're called, what's called the rollovers, um, because obviously it is a concern. Uh, now, keeping in mind that if and when we're on to that next stage and we're into that implementation period under the withdrawal agreement, um, that you will still be having, that the DIT will still be having to actually roll over um, the existing agreements or create new standalone UK agreements on top of its new new. Uh, new third country um, uh, pursuits. So there is a concern about um, being stretched to capacity there. Um, and the two other questions I wanted to ask. Firstly, is UK government policy to simply seek, as you were describing earlier on, to roll over existing arrangements with third party countries, i.e. non-EU countries, where you can, I think you said um, that you can literally delete EU and insert UK. I mean, is that the kind of default position they're trying to achieve? I think that was an assumption at the beginning, yeah. but it's not that easy. And, and I think that's really important to point out. There is not a single agreement where you can just strike out EU and write UK and it's done. Yeah. Uh, there's always the devil in the detail. Um, if you have rules of origin, tariff rate quotas, all of these need to be readjusted, renegotiated. You need to possibly find formulas to, with regard to the agreements that have been done, it seems that these ba are based on past trade flows with some opening where those trade flows were so low that you can't really say anything. Yeah. Uh, so uh, there's always, there's a lot of change going on. And if you look at the Switzerland agreement, Switzerland, of course, is one of those countries where that had a lot of agreements with the EU, I think 120 or something like that rather enormous, a lot of them based on EU law, and you can uh, see a model uh, sort of emerging. Everything that was based on EU law, where the Swiss are aligned, 
basically it's difficult to roll over and cannot at times be rolled over at all because uh, currently the UK is not ready to commit to a line in, in, in those respects. So you not see... To commit to a, to a line on regulatory... Because terms. that would, exactly, that would mean aligning yeah. to EU regulation, which of course sure. is something that will be done in the EU negotiations. Mm -hmm. So all of those negotiations have a bit where you can already do something. Mm -hmm. That's the standard trade agreements, tariffs and those things. And then there's a regulatory bit concerning things like SPS, that currently cannot really be covered and Sorry, is not SPS. covered. Oh, that's uh, sanitary and phytosanitary standards. Okay. That simplifies controls at the borders okay. by basically saying Switzerland will follow EU rules. Um, then you'll have sort of veterinary exams in the country, mm. and then you don't need those strict border controls that you otherwise have between countries. Mm. Okay, thank you. Um, Dr. Bartels, can I ask you one last question? You mentioned, I think, um, in the context of the Irish border, something, a, a product or a 40-foot you know, container coming in from China, ultimate, ultimate destination in the UK. But it, in the scenario where we've left the European Union, that container arrives in Dublin, goes up and crosses the Irish border, forgetting all the detail of that, and then comes to the UK. Presumably it's by definition come into the EU before it comes into the United Kingdom. So it'll therefore have to have been okayed as it um, was stamped coming through Dublin Harbour. Am I, what, am I missing something here about how no, that's going to work? No, th that's perfectly correct. Um, I mean, uh, one would imagine um, that when it comes to um, uh, tariffs, that you know, usually the tariff will be higher, so that would stop that from being a problem. Yeah. But it's not always the case, because the EU has a lot of free trade agreements, and as we've just been hearing, uh, the UK doesn't uh, yet. And so it's conceivable that you get a product coming in under a free trade agreement um, into the EU, uh, which then um, you know, finds its way into the UK without having to pay what should be the UK tariff. Uh, I mean, a, a good example of this is Turkey. No? I mean, if you were a Turkish um, truck driver, you'd be thinking of driving to Dublin yeah. instead of London. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that uh, you know, that, that's the risk that the um, uh, UK government note of, uh, when was this, last week, the week before, um, things moved pretty quickly, uh, was addressing and uh, essentially accepting and talking about justifying and, and so on. So there is definitely a risk there. It's not as though, um, you know, so long as it's in the EU first, everything is dealt with. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Ewing. So, as you have just said, uh, Dr. Bartels, um, things are moving very quickly, but as of this morning, we are eight days away from crashing out with no deal. That is one scenario that is now, as the convener said earlier, looking, sadly, a bit more likely than it ever has done. So, my first question is, because the information that we are getting is second-hand, because we, the, the Brexit Secretary doesn't deem us worthy of direct contact. So we're getting stuff passed on from the House of Lords, which is very good of the House of Lords to do so. Um, the last kind of update we got was the 25th of January, so obviously things probably have changed a wee bit. So my question, first question is, where are we today in terms of what has the UK signed or is about to sign such that it's in effect a signed trade deal? What trade deals are there? So in eight days', eight days time, we can rely on those trade deals. What trade deals have already been put into place? And I mean, I, how many? I don't know. Is it seven or six? Or? I, um, I mean, I don't, I don't have any more information. <laughs> I don't have access to the Brexit Secretary either. Um, but I, it's, it's what's publicly available. No? Uh, there's Switzerland. Um, and, and we're talking about basic agreements. Some of them, uh, and Holger will be able to speak to this, I think, uh, in probably more detail via his work and the um, uh, European uh, or for the European Scrutiny Committee and the Lords, um, sometimes it, these agreements are being advertised by the government as new trade agreements, as though they're you know rock solid gold standard trade agreements. But they're not really. They're they're bundles of two agreements, and one of them is um, on the assumption that there's a withdrawal agreement, a transitional period, and then the other one is on the assumption there's an, a no deal, uh, which is uh, a much more basic sort of agreement, which is essentially tariffs only. Um, how many of these do we have? Uh, well, you know, uh, from small to big, Liechtenstein, uh, Faroe Islands, um, uh, 
uh, Norway, I think now, um, Iceland do we have, uh, Switzerland. Um, it, that's sort of it. Um, I don't think there's a great deal more than that. I'm probably forgetting, Israel. you know. Yeah. Israel, Palestine. 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 Chile, Chile's probably. So Switzerland, yeah, Chile, but it's, yeah, I mean, it's in process. There was, oh, uh, ESA, yeah, that's right, Eastern and Southern Africa, which, by the way, does not include South Africa. Um, I think that's worth putting on record. I've noticed that um, that point is not made. Uh, in fact, uh, and I used to advise both regions, so I'm familiar with the makeup. Um, the South African region is called SADC, Southern African Development Community. That is South Africa, SACU, which is Southern African Customs Union, and then um, 14 countries in total. ESA is countries to the east. Um, and the SADC negotiations are going badly, as I understand it. They were supposed to go well. Um, the South African Trade Minister, Rob Davies, uh, seemed to get on very well with uh, our trade secretary and there was all sorts of positive noises uh, coming out and um, it turns out that as of last week, the last time I looked at this, no negotiations have in fact not been so easy. There are sticking points on, for instance, sanitary and phytosanitary standards, which South Africa has a concern about, in particular citrus black spot, um, Namibian uh, uh, in uh, beef uh, with a bone in it. Um, and so on. So they are negotiating these sorts of issues and that hasn't been sorted out. Okay. Let me maybe add, so there's, there's the, uh, the big trade agreements and I think of those, Switzerland is the most important, Norway, um, but we haven't seen the Norway agreement yet. Uh, my guess would be that there's uh, not going to be a lot on services, so uh, all of the regulatory bit that we now have will fall away but there will be uh, probably the zero tariff part. Um, and uh, the, the agreements mentioned, I would like to add though that there's a number of small ag agreements that people tend to forget because we focus on the big trade agreements. Uh, those concern, for example, mutual recognition. And there are some of those. Uh, there's an agreement also with Switzerland on insurance services, with the uh, US on prudential measures. I think so for what could be expected in this difficult situation from DIT, I would actually say they've done a fairly good job uh, of what was possible because you have to think that you're going to your trading partner and you're saying, we want to roll over this agreement. And then the trading partner says, but isn't there going to be a transition period which you're negotiating in the withdrawal agreement? You say, well, yes, that's what we hope and that's what we expect, what we're negotiating. And then they say, so, so what are the arrangements afterwards like? And they say, we don't really know yet. So that's a very difficult negotiation situation for anything regulatory, because you don't know what the situation will actually be, and you're asking your partner to commit resources to negotiate something that might not be necessary, or that might fall away anyway, or that it's a difficult situation. Uh, and I think the, the, the problem that I see, the, ma the main problems in the process, lack of transparency and over-advertising, and overselling, which was part of a lot of the debates of saying, we will roll over all agreements by the end date, and then we brief people on condition of secrecy. People need to trade on these agreements. If you are using the Turkey uh, Customs Union, <coughs> and you're building your cars in Turkey, it would be advantageous to know what happens in two weeks. Eight days? Uh, I mean, I do not criticize government lightly. I think the process of the handling in terms of communication with industry about the rollovers has been pretty awful. Um, without betraying confidential information of the meetings, it, it, it's very difficult to be briefed on things and not be able to engage with them on the membership. Um, and it means that, you know, and, and you know, most of our members, company directors, are not following the ins and outs of all of this. Uh, they are relying on the same headlines that most people read. And so when you see, uh, you know, there seems to be, on the one hand, uh, a real proactive push, albeit belated, to get people ready for um, uh, no EU deal, but there doesn't seem to have been the same urgency on telling businesses that there are some negotiations, some trade preferences which may be ended. Um, and considering the fact that from the beginning you knew, one knew that anywhere, any, any set of arrangements there, there was a heavy intersection with the EU, Turkey in particular, I mean, you, you could say that you sh it would have been much more helpful to make clear at the beginning of this process that there was a strong possibility that these might not be rolled over in time. 
um, because it would have helped businesses get prepared and be cognizant. I mean, just just to just to explain. There are a lot of businesses who sometimes don't know or are members who don't know that they're using these agreements because very often, if they are, it's being handled by their freight forwarding company. They may have hired someone to make efficiencies in their supply chain and they suggested using the trade agreement and most businesses are basically saying, that's fine, do, do what, what's helpful, what's advantageous to the company. So, and this is anecdotal, but I'm concerned by how often I hear it. When you ask companies if they are trading with Turkey under the customs union, they have no idea or they say no. And then you ask them what form they're using. And it's an ATR form. And if you're using the ATR form, you are using the customs union agreement. Um, so we would have liked to have seen the same kind of get ready campaign on um, the rollovers, potentially not all panning out as people had perhaps been led to believe, as you see on the EU no deal preparations. Mm -hmm. Well, that's more gloom and doom, really. Um, two quick questions for me, Camila, uh, touching on, um, so a, a reference was made uh, by one of you to the issue of geographical in indications and so forth. Uh, where, so in a scenario of eight days, no deal out, very few trade agreements, where does that issue stand? Because, of course, that's very important for Scotland uh, in particular. And the second issue concerns services. Uh, and including, importantly, services uh, provided to uh, the EU27, in particular in the financial services sector. So those two issues, because in eight days, if there's no deal, these have presumably very immediate consequences for those services. Sectors. And I'll, I'll leave geographical indications. This is a split that we've had for about 20 years. Um, on uh, services, um, the default position um, is that the UK will be a third country. So now speaking about UK mm -hmm. versus um, not just EU, but EEA um, more generally, the default position is that the UK is a third country, which means it's in the same position as Australia and New Zealand, um, a third country without a, a free trade agreement. Uh, and that's obviously going to be a massive hit. The UK, as everybody knows, has a large trade surplus in services, and this is uh, quite a big deal. Of course, one does need to distinguish a little bit between what the international guarantees of providing services are under the WTO and under free trade agreements, and for that matter, under EU law, from what actually happens, because it's not to say that services will stop being supplied. It depends very much on the type of service. If you're uh, supplying an unregulated service in a country which doesn't much care, um, like, uh, you know, I don't know, hairdressing or something, it, you know, aside from visa issues, um, there's no particular difficulty. Things could well continue. If you're supplying regulated services and medical services or legal services, then the situation is quite different. Um, so one has to distinguish between the guarantees and then domestic regulation, which might itself just say, well, you know, continue to come. That said, um, there are, of course, on both sides, um, no-deal contingency planning uh, arrangements which are being set up. The UK has said, well, we're going to just continue, essentially, uh, in many areas, including in financial services, for the time being. Um, the EU, my understanding is that within the EU, there is a difference of opinion between the European Commission which likes to take quite a hard line and say, well, it's all over, Red Rover. Um, if you're lucky, we'll offer you some equivalence decisions, which we will you know, give and take uh, uh, as we see fit. And the member states, on the other hand, which are keener on keeping business as usual, and we need to see how that plays out. That is a dynamic that I haven't seen very much reported in the press. Um, but I know uh, that it is a dynamic that's there, and I think at this point the member states may well start to prevail over the commission. Can I, so just to, because on, on the issue specifically of financial services, so you know the single banking license, the single investment services license, single insurance passport, that is subject to the mutual recognition deal with the minimum harmonisation of standards. So that is very, very EU law heavy. And, you know, whether the member state, one individual member state wishes to do something slightly different, they have really no leeway to do so because it is an area of EU law that is really uh, laid down in, in, in terms and there have been many, many cases before the European Court of Justice. So they don't really have any discretion with regard to the single banking licence and the single investment services licence. No, no, do I they? don't mean that they'll go it alone. Um, 
there is a little bit of talk of going it alone when it comes to ports, you know, Calais and so on. So I'm not referring to, um, you know, uh, operating outside of the normal scope of EU law. Rather, what I'm referring to is the member states acting in council to tell the commission what to do. I think your point about, so, so for services, um, because we get this question a lot, and it's a lot harder to give a one-size-fits-all answer on what your barriers you are going to face in services, which is, um, so, so the lack of, of uh, when you compare it to the single market and goods and the customs union, harmonization to the same extent is both a benefit and a drawback, I think, to business. On the one hand, um, you may see less immediate automatic impact across all of the 27, because to some extent, outside of the more harmonized area, which you referred to that I'll come back to, it can depend on how the third country or how each EU member state treats that uh, third country. Um, but that's also a complication because it means, unlike with uh, the single market goods and customs union, I cannot tell a manufacturing company that they are going to face the exact same rule in um, Germany as they are in Belgium, for example. So there's more discretion, which may uh, mitigate some of the impact, but it also complicates planning because it's so dependent on the third country in question. So the, 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 the passport, the sort of banking license you referred to effectively, what that stops the UK from being, or UK providers, suppliers of services from being able to continue to do is to basically have one foot in all 27 just through that license. They will have to recertify, relicense in each EU country. Um, but, and, and, you know, when you are a business looking at what is the most um, efficient place to, to locate, it will completely depend on each in individual's third country's licensing regime, each member state's, excuse me, licensing regime for third countries. Yes, indeed. And, and we've seen that many of the major players are, are you know, are um, showing, you know, what their plan is by just moving their effective head office to an EU 27. Yeah. Member State and uh, you know a, a vast outflow of capital because of course the, the head office it has to be more than a boilerplate and it has to have it subject to prudential regulation with capital adequacy and so forth so there has to be a, a, an asset base in that member state of incorporation and the assets are going so well, this yeah, is surely we... a, a worry to. When we, organization. We, we, the last data that we have on this was from January. We asked about re, um, uh, relocation and or, because for some companies it is physically having to relocate. For some it is um, my, by necessity expanding, I guess you could say, but it is moving or expanding um, operations outside of the UK to the EU. And we explicitly asked whether this was in connection to Brexit because there are people who will be moving for other mm. reasons. Um, so, so we did include that option and effectively what we found was um, I think about 29, 30% uh, have either moved or are seriously considering doing so. Um, and I, that's the only reason I had my laptop open was I was checking the Scotland. Um, I think it's about the same, at the same share as well to a certain extent. Really briefly before Holger probably comes in on geographical indications. Um, I haven't seen the absolute latest. The UK was intending to introduce a register for, um, to continue providing those protections for GIs. Um, I don't know where it is in the process though at this stage. Very quickly on um, uh, the uh, point of finance moving. I think uh, it's important to draw a distinction between what's happening in a period of uh, uncertainty and what would happen when there's an actual cliff edge from the perspective of the EU member states. Ultimately, they don't want their consumers of financial services to uh, be in trouble. Now, the EU does nicely out of a period of uncertainty because there's no cost to the consumers, there's a cost to the suppliers. They have to set up in two locations waiting to see what happens. The fact that all you know, business has been moving to the EU in advance is smooth um, and uh, that is very different and so that's of no particular consequence to the EU member states. In fact, it's a good thing for them when they want to attract that sort of business, but I think they're not facing the wrath of consumers whose contracts will collapse from one day to the other, and I think um, one needs to also look at that scenario, which would be their position in a no-deal situation, and um, they might look at the situation a little bit differently. That's what I was referring to. I have to confess that I um, <clears throat> stopped looking at this ever since I've spent all of my day reading treaties, uh, but as to GIs, the EU puts GI protection in its treaties, and the UK actually does so too in the rollover agreements. Uh, it's a little bit different from uh, other treaty obligations seizing, as for example, in services or trade in goods, where you know that immediately everything will change in the partner country if the treaty ceases in effect, because quite often you force the other country to change their regulations. They grant a 
quasi-property position. And I would argue that's actually problematic to withdraw, even if the treaty obligation to have it falls away. Uh, because you have granted a property position, you cannot just take it away. Uh, but we'll have to see how countries react. The problem in IP is, of course, larger because it also uh, includes trademarks and EU trademarks that will cease in effect for the UK. I have not quite seen uh, what exactly the UK plans to do in, in this regard, uh, but uh, I've always considered that a rather important issue. I think it's an opt-out for trademark. I mean, the, sorry, just really briefly, the, the difference between... So GIs was a big issue that was settled late in the day in the withdrawal agreement. Um, I think for trade-off purposes, if I'm speaking frankly, although I'm not in the negotiations, it is something that you would not give away lightly, even if you want the continued protection of your own, um, because of what some people might consider, and I think there's a division of opinion within the trade policy community about this, to what extent continuing to afford those protections currently provided to um, uh, uh, products under EU law that exists now, whether that complicates your trade negotiations in future. I don't think it does to the same extent as others, because if you look at the TTIP negotiations, the UK had ample opportunity to actually register plenty of products and didn't. I don't think it did any, as far as I know. Um, that may be also, just thinking of obviously Scotch whiskey, um, that may be to some extent because I think that industry is very good at not relying on trade agreements to do that work. It does a lot of its own bilateral work with governments to get that registered, to get protection for uh, Scotch whiskey onto other GI registers in other countries. Okay. Thank you. Can I ask a very quick supplementary on this issue of GI? Because um, in, the, in the, the table that was sent to us by the House of Lords Committee, outlining some of the different agreements that had been signed or were about to be signed, um, it has an agreement with uh, the UK and the US on the mutual recognition of certain distilled spirits and drinks. And then it also has a separate agreement between the UK and Mexico on the mutual recognition of distilled spirits and spirit drink. Now, in the agreement with the US and the UK, it talks about protecting spirits such as Scotch whiskey and Tennessee whiskey. But in the one with Mexico, it specifically mentions GIs. It doesn't mention GIs in the agreement between with the US. Is there a reason why it would feature with Mexico but not the US? So I think this is a, it's a hugely complex field, which is made complex furthermore by the fact that uh, the EU was able to achieve something in the World Trade Organization. If you look at the TRIPS agreement, that's the uh, WTO agreement on intellectual property, you can see that wines and spirits receive a slightly different treat treatment from other areas. Uh, the UK, or the US's position actually, was always, uh, we don't really like uh, GI protection. What we will do is we'll grant a protection under other laws as some sort of trademark, because we don't like the concept of a GI. And I would assume that this is where the difference comes in, uh, that the US will then grant a different form of intellectual property uh, protection rather than GI protection. Is it anything to worry about? Is it something no, I don't think about? that's particularly something to worry. That's just a long-standing uh, uh, trade conflict between EU concepts, which say, the EU argues that GI protection is something that is inherent in the territory where something is grown. So they would say, if you do uh, Parmesan cheese and you do it in the area where Parmigiano Reggiano comes from, it's inherently different from doing the precise same proce uh, process in Minnesota. It's unique because of the territory. And you can only grow it there. That's the original GI concept. The US doesn't sign up to this. And it, it, the, the, the conflict has been particularly arduous when it comes to one type of beer, Budweiser, because the US produces Budweiser under the name of Budweiser. And there's also a town in the Czech Republic called Budweiser in German, actually Budjevice Budvar in Czech. And they produce their own beer. And they have it protected as a GI in the European Union. And that clashes with the US trademark everywhere in the world. It's an issue. GIs are an issue between the EU and the US because it's an 
and I think unlike most other, you have GIs and trade agreements, but it is a huge offensive interest for the EU. It is effectively exporting its GI regime to get other countries to recognize it. The reason, and you'll probably detect from my accent that, that I have a slight window into it, the reason it is a particular issue in the US is because you have, in, for specific products, not all products, particularly with cheese, you have a lot of European immigrants who came over in the 19th century who have continued to use the name cheddar, Gouda, etc. So they have effectively become generic terms in the US. And their issue with it is they don't want to force their own Produ uh, their own producers, their own consumers, to have to change their labelling laws just to reflect the EU's effectively. Let's get other members in. Uh, Alexander Stewart, followed by Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Convener. We all know that the, the clock is ticking and time is running out, but every single organisation has been putting contingencies in plan. Uh, that we've, we've been told that, that, and that continually happens across all the sectors, whether it's in good services or it's in... Uh, uh, in, in products or, or environment, whatever we're involved in. So we, we know that's that the case, but we still find ourselves uh, in this dire situation, potentially, uh, that in a few days' time, uh, we're over that uh, situation. And if that does occur, uh, there have been huge rules talked about the temporary measures that may require to be put in place, and you've gone into some of these today already about what might happen and what could happen. Uh, but realistically, uh, you know, your fears, your own uh, anxieties about how we find ourselves in this situation and how will it evolve in the, f the next few weeks, depending on how things progress? What is your take on the whole process? Because, as I say, every, every individual organisation and every commentator and every uh, academic has a view as to how things might happen. Uh, but do you have a take as to how severe it will be? Or are we being over ambitious about what we think is going to happen, or is it really going to uh, be as dire as, as many people believe? I think if you were looking at it, particularly let's focus on goods briefly, and, and I have to say actually that, um, just, just so it's for the record, I think about 40% of our members have done contingency planning. Um, another 40% say they're not going to do it until they know what they're adjusting to. And these tend to be the smaller companies who, as one member put it to me, you know, spends 50% of his time dealing with known quantity compliance issues and the rest of his time trying to run his business. So while there are some things I think that you can uh, anticipate under WTO terms, there's a lot that you can't. And if I just take goods, for example, um, the, if you listen to the logistics and the transport industry who really know what's required to move their products across borders, they are probably the most vocally unhappy at the moment. And I think the reason for that is um, from the UK's end, some of the, for example, simplified procedures that are being brought in to mitigate uh, disruption, at least in the areas it can control on imports, have been brought in very late like February, you're not giving traders much time to actually overhaul their own trade management systems. So the concern, I think, and you hear it from them in particular, is uh, not about the new controls, uh, which I think are more applicable going into the EU than coming in, because the UK has more leeway to relax some of those where, um, to a certain extent. It's more about the disruption potentially coming from traders who are not used to these forms and not used to these procedures and therefore do not have correct documentation. Um, there's reports about the Netherlands basically creating a uh, the effect that's sort of tantamount to a lorry park to basically because they're anticipating people not having correct information and needing to be pulled aside. That's where I think the particular concern about disruption comes from, and you won't know that until the day. I feel there will be two different components to, to what's going on. I, I think the first thing that I want to say is it's really important to point out problems because only if you point them out can you tackle them. The discussion that criticizes people that point out problem, I, uh, I find highly uh, unproductive because we need to know where the problems are, otherwise we'll be surprised by them. I think every single administrative change, if there's a new form in a well-existing administration, creates problems. There are people who have not seen the form, there are people who don't know how to fill out the form, that's utterly normal, and why would it not happen now when you change a lot of forms? So, there will be initial problems that can at times be grave in, in the terms of uh, more lorries being pulled aside, more delays, some customs officials being confused by what they actually have to demand because they haven't read the briefing papers. Uh, that will last for a little bit, like any radical change, and then you'll get over it and you'll be in a new normal. That new normal will be at a lower level with more controls, with more difficulties. Um, but also with, a, again, a steady flow. 
with more difficulties as these things go. Uh, yeah, I, I essentially agree with that. I mean, um, systems, when they work smoothly, don't take very much to be badly disrupted. There are recent examples, five-hour delays in the Eurostar because of a little strike. Um, or you might remember um, the uh, uh, US administration's new immigration rules um, uh, some time ago, which caused uh, immense hold-ups at the airport. I mean, it really doesn't take very much. A new form, I think, uh, would essentially do it, but that is different, as Holger was saying, from um, you know, the underlying uh, friction that you would get from proper regulatory change. And you, you talked about 40% you know, of businesses being prepared for some aspect, and, and you talked about maybe 30% of companies moving around uh, to try and find new locations, potentially, because that will mitigate some of the difficulties they face. Uh, but that still leaves a massive amount of businesses in, in a very difficult uh, and a very unknown uh, situation as to what might happen to the, uh, as they move forward. Uh, and, and views on that? Yeah, I mean, I think... I am just most concerned about lots of businesses getting caught up by nasty surprises. Um, I think in a way that may be more relevant, but maybe not so immediate for services, because I think understanding, particularly in the areas where there isn't a lot of harmonized EU law, um, it may take some companies by surprise. It may take some time to be, to, to be you know, felt, depending when you're trying to change a contract, a cross-border contract. Um, you know, lots of businesses have been sitting down with their suppliers and their customers in other countries. Um, you know, but for example, some companies do not have what we call inco terms in their contracts, which makes clear where the responsibility um, lies if something goes wrong effectively. Um, and if that hasn't really been um, dealt with, you could have unpleasant discussions down the track. So it may not be immediate, it may be a gradual realization of the problems as they arise. And, and we, we touched on the sort of temporary measures that will be put in place and the rollover and all of that that's, that's attempting to be supportive if, if we're in that position. Uh, but really, how realistic is that? Uh, I, we've, we've already heard today about some of the crises that may happen in some sectors uh, and, and some, in some industries about how, how they're not in that situation and they're not prepared. Uh, uh, but as I say, business will still go on, uh, but it'll be in a different format uh, and a different way. I think the temporary nature is, is um, a big concern and probably one of the more sources of frustration to business rather than the change itself that may come on the day is how many times it's going to be redone effectively. Um, because you know, the whole point of the implementation period under the withdrawal agreement is to keep everything the same and change once. Um, I think that there uh, is a, an impression that is given on leaving without a deal that that is the end or that provides certainty. Um, considering it's very likely the UK would continue to negotiate with the EU and change its temporary measures, um, I think people should be disabused of that notion. Okay. Thank you. I wanted to say some of the temporary measures will, as always, work better. Others will not work as well. For example, the, what, what I, from what I've read about Northern Ireland in the public DIT announcement, I don't see how this will work for long. Okay. Thank you. Gibson, followed by uh, Stuart. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, convener. A lot of things I would have liked to have touched on, such as uh, imports via Ireland, transparency, rollovers and priorities have already been covered. So please see the committee uh, uh, members are thinking along the same lines. Capacity was also touched on. And I know Ms Renison talked about numbers not being necessarily an issue, but what about the ability and experience of the people that are actually uh, carrying out these negotiations and the political support that they have behind them? Is that an issue? Yeah, again, I, I cautious because I'm not within government, so I don't want to I, I speak to what is going on within government. But all I can say is from engagement and looking at it from an externally, um, there is a concern about doing so many things at once. Um, uh, particularly once we get into the, the next phase. That's obviously complicated if you are um, in a no-deal scenario and you're having to do mitigating measures plus negotiations with all these countries that you are maybe not able to roll over the deals with plus third new, 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 new um, arrangements. Again, there are a lot of civil servants who have, um, maybe not necessarily purely on trade, but been working, negotiating with the EU within the confines of the EU. Now, that is a very different setting, obviously, to negotiating from the outside, but there is a fair bit of experience there. Um, the one thing I think is worth raising is, uh, and again, I, I can't speak um, confidently to what's going on with the government, but there have been questions raised about the um, openness towards accepting external uh, advice or people who have worked on these before. Um, I think there is maybe a tendency within government to rotate people um, uh, and maybe potentially an aversion to bringing in people from the outside. 
That may, and that's as far as I will go with that because I'm not in government, that may be a function of salary, that may be a function of wanting to keep things in-house. That, to me, is a, is a concern for at least trade negotiations with the rest of the world. Okay. I would also want to add, uh, besides the experience, I think it's really important to have the right procedures in place. The further you move away from trying to just get what you already have and reproduce it, the more you will be, as a negotiator, at a loss of what it actually is you want, and then you need to you need partners in industry to be to talk to them and and to say, look, you know, I'm negotiating a concrete number for rules of origin. I need to know what our industry does, and those procedures have to be in place, and there has to be the, a, a, a capacity to openly consult with industry and to make sure that if you consult with industry, it's actually representative of the country's interest, rather than you're being captured by one particular person that you talk to. Yeah, and I mean, the, there's, a, there's complexities, obviously, in um, how these uh, deals are actually negotiated. In terms of the bilateral trade agreements already um, agreed, not that there's that many, I mean, are they seen by you uh, as a panel to favour uh, producer interests, particularly exporters, or consumer interests? The, the currently existing agreements? Yes, the ones that are being signed, the, the, current, the trade agreements that have been signed. So, so, so uh, from what... I have seen, my personal judgment mm -hmm. is that they're actually largely really trying to just reproduce the agreement that existed before wherever possible, and then at times cut the parts that cannot be reproduced. So uh, whatever they do, they try to do the same thing that was done before by the EU agreement. Um, I think there's often an issue in the consultation processes that... Uh, I'm sorry to say that, but that industry doesn't want consumer interests on board in consultation processes. That has certainly been a large discussion in the US. Um, and we need that discussion here to, to say in the consultation panels that the trade negotiators will have access to, we also want consumer interests present for the future. I don't think it's such a large concern at the moment because... Um, most of the agreements really try to just reproduce. Actually, for some agreements, it's more problematic, like Norway, because you can't really reproduce that. Yes, I, I do think any of us share Boris Johnson's um, attitude towards business, but I think it's also important that, that the public are reassured that their interests are also being defended in terms of these agreements uh, going forward. Also, I mean, uh, from Institute of Directors' perspective, is there, a, is there a feeling that the government is... Uh, looking at this kind of um, in a broad brush way, or are they favouring particular uh, sectors or industries? Uh, do you feel in terms of these agreements? I mean, I, I hear obviously what's being said about trying to replicate existing agreements, but in terms of developing uh, new ones and going into unknown territory, I don't think they've gotten that far. Um, you know, I, uh, it would have been. I, I'm, I'm trying to make allowances for the manic nature in which all of this is being done. Having said that, it would have been ideal, you know, there was a white paper from the Department for International Trade. Um, I think for most people who work on trade policy, uh, speaking for myself at least, I found it slightly basic. Um, it didn't really, you know, if it, and this, I always give the sort of counter example. If you look at what, for example, the New Zealand government produced a couple of years ago, um, it was a very detailed sort of outcome of consultation with lots of different stakeholders about the strategic agenda of what they wanted to do with their trade policy. Now, to some extent, going into the detail is slightly difficult if you don't know what alignment you are going to maintain or not with the EU. So I think you have to make that. There, there is a sort of a inevitability about that to a certain extent. Having said that, you know, you ask the question, why, how and why did we pick Australia, New Zealand, and the US? Um, and looking at the CPTPP, the sort of mega regional um, agreement in the Asia Pacific, uh, I don't know. Um, you know, you need to sort of be clear about who, what is your agenda? Who do you want to do trade agreements with and why? In what areas does it make sense to focus more on um, uh, intellectual property, for example? Um, what do you want to do with uh, China, for example? Is that a long-term aim? Um, you need a lot more detail than I think what, than what's been provided for in the uh, white paper, but the simple answer to the question yet is I don't honestly think that the government has gotten that far, or if they have, it hasn't been very open. We know what the U.S. trade agreement, uh, U.S. trade negotiators' objectives are. We have no idea what they are from the U.K.'s bent.
Yes, well, I mean, Dr Hestermeyer, in paragraph 18, you talked about in your document, uh, your submission, you talked about the la lack of transparency, but do you feel as a, and, and the same yourself, Dr Bertels, do you feel as a lack of strategic thinking going forward? I think there's... A, there are a number of huge problems at the moment, and I'm not entirely optimistic they can be resolved. So, for example, there have been public calls for some new trade agreements. How can you currently, in this environment, have the time to sit down calmly and to reflect about what you want from a trade agreement with New Zealand when you're trying to adapt your business to Brexit and, and coping with all of the other things on top? Uh, so, yes, I would say there has been a, a lack of strategic thinking and there has been a lack of debate about what it is the country really wants and there's been a replacement debate instead of debating what are the food standards, what are the animal welfare standards, uh, there has been a debate about do we want an agreement with the US or do we want an agreement with the EU in the abstract without ever saying what does this mean concretely and, and I think that's highly problematic going forward. Yeah, that's very helpful. Um, I have to disclose I've been quite heavily involved in training, trade negotiators, um, so I need to be careful about what I say. I want to be fair um, and accurate. Um, some of these, I, I would say that it's, an, it's a situation that in its complexity is probably unparalleled um, in any country uh, in the world. Um, it's a huge area to get on top of. Um, all at once. So, for instance, the uh, government is proposing to negotiate or renegotiate in parallel, um, you know, well, I mean, the, the data is now out, uh, more than a dozen agreements, all at the same time, without, in addition, as Holger was saying, um, and in anticipation of this, having worked out basic domestic policy questions because it hasn't had to do that. So, uh, for instance, we don't know really what the UK's um, agricultural policy is. Now, how can you negotiate a free trade agreement where even though agriculture, let's face it, um, you know, in economic terms, is uh, overall not much, right? It's less than 1% of the UK's GDP, I think 0.6%. Of course, depending on where you are, it can be more. Right, depends on your constituency. But overall, agriculture is relatively small, like very small, in fact. Um, but it is the major holdup in any trade negotiation. You need to know what your policy is uh, and, and what your flexibilities are and what your choices are going to be. So that needs to be done before you went, embark on a trade negotiation, let alone more than a dozen trade negotiations all at the same time, and then all these other questions that we've been covering to date. Now, that's one pressure that I think any government would struggle with. In addition, of course, um, the UK is doing this from scratch. There was, three years ago, virtually no knowledge in the government about trade. I gave a talk um, in 2015, I think it was, um, and all the people who were interested in trade, or who at least were free uh, and in enough, you know, free enough and interested enough to be free, to come and talk, uh, listen to what I had to say, um, you know, it was a handful of people who really had any idea. Now, I have to say that in the last three years, that has improved impressively. It has been three years. Um, in 2016, matters were extremely dire, but it's now 2019. And I have to say um, the, uh, that time has not been wasted. People have learnt. I would say the outstanding issues that are problematic are, first of all, salaries. Now, if you're going to, st there's still a need to buy in, uh, buy in people with information. That means you've got to pay them. Where is this information? Uh, who are the people who actually know this stuff, people who've been working in this area? Well, they're either academics, and there are a few of them. I mean, you know, half of them are here today in the country, just about. I mean, a few more, but, you know, if we include other people who are around the table. Um, there are, uh, and they've got academic jobs. Um, then you have people who work in, uh, for other countries. Well, they're going to continue to work for other countries because that's their job. Um, then you've got people who work in law firms, and they earn money. Now, to attract all of these people, you're going to need to pay money. And you can see, for instance, with the attempt to recruit people to the Trade Remedies Authority or, for that matter, to DIT and so on, people are just not coming because the salaries are not high enough. And that you can see reflected in the fact that most people who work in these departments um, are young. Right? It's starter jobs for a lot of people. 
So that's a challenge. You just need money. And money would fix some of this, um, maybe not all of it. Then in addition, I would say what I've seen is uh, two other problems that uh, the government needs to uh, cope with, um, some of them inevitable. One of them is coordination between government departments. You get certain areas, like services, where you have you know, five, six, seven government departments who all want to control this, or tariffs, who controls this between DIT and HMRC. Or um, you have, um, uh, you know, with uh, agriculture, even tariff rate quotas, DEFRA uh, has a dedicated TRQ's team that is interested in, you know, rectification of WTO schedules, which one might have thought would be the sort of thing that DIT would do. Then, of course, you've got the FCO. I mean, when it comes to the trade agreements, you've got a split between the FCO, uh, DEXU, DIT, um, uh, who am I forgetting? There are, uh, no, uh, Bayes has an interest. I mean, you know, you've got lots of government departments all dealing with different FTAs, different aspects of them, even taking the lead on them in different ways. So there's a coordination issue. Um, again, every government struggles with this, and, they, and it's difficult if you don't have the negotiator with an important role around the table. That's why some countries bundle trade with foreign affairs. It's not so much that trade is foreign affairs, there's an element of that, but it's largely because the foreign affairs minister counts around the table and is able to overrule other cabinet colleagues in order to get a trade point across. Otherwise, you can't negotiate with anything. So there's that. And then there's a peculiarity, I think, of the UK civil service, which I might sound a little bit like I'm feathering my nest and Holger's nest, uh, and our other legal colleagues, but I find it surprising um, that the UK civil service has a, not surprising maybe in terms of where it comes from, but surprising that this is still very much, the, seems to be the culture, a culture of generalism. Now, the problem with generalism is that it works fine when you're dealing with domestic policy because you can pull in experts as you see fit. Um, and, of course, without a written constitution in this country, you don't really need legal experts because everything is policy at the end of the day, right? And if you don't like the policy, you change the law. And, you know, there is a really uh, different approach to the role of lawyers um, and other experts in the UK civil service than you see in other countries, particularly in the EU, and part of that is because they're used to constitutions other reasons as well. When it comes to domestic affairs, that's okay. When it comes to international affairs, that's not. Now, the FCO, which is uh, used to dealing internationally, plays, um, places a huge importance on law. That's why the FCO legal advisor is such a monumentally important figure in how the FCO operates. I haven't seen the same importance placed on lawyers, and in particular trade lawyers or treaty lawyers or whoever it happens to be, uh, in the relevant government department. It's not to say they're not interested in the law, but from what I know, um, lawyers are somewhat segregated in these departments. They are not their front and centre. They are seen a little bit like... Um, you know, uh, the way a defamation lawyer might be seen if you're running a newspaper or a TV station. You know, you, you, you run things by them to make sure things are okay. You get things implemented in legal language. That's the wrong way around. Law is the language of trade. It is the language of international relations. And if lawyers are not there at the very beginning, um, you'll be faced with a job of translate. You'll, you'll, you'll be speaking the wrong language and having to translate into another language late in the day. And I think that that is a cultural problem that has um, that the UK civil service has not yet grappled with. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Stuart McMillan. Uh, thank you, uh, convener. Um, just uh, a couple of uh, questions. First of all, uh, on the issue of uh, GDP, and you just touched upon uh, GDP a few moments ago, uh, Dr Bartles. Um, figures were published uh, this week uh, regarding uh, Scotland's uh, economic situation. Uh, unemployment uh, reached a, a new low down to 3.4%, uh, GDP uh, up um, by 0.3% in the fourth quarter of 2018. Uh, and that's despite the, the backdrop uh, of, uh, of Brexit. Um, uh, and with uh, the huge uncertainty uh, that, that we do face, how do you how, how do you think the, the GDP situation will actually fare in, in Scotland and also the UK? I mean, I'm afraid I can't really answer that because it's a little bit outside my uh, scope of competence. So I, I can't really speak to uh, economic matters. Um, yeah, I think I'd rather just sorry, but hand over. That question. Um, I mean, I, 
business organizations tend to be more comfortable talking about the impact on businesses rather than trying to project ahead. Now, um, I don't know if the question was relative to specific Brexit scenario or no deal specifically. Um, you know, there are certain areas, you know, that if you, on the one hand, just take it as an example, um, there are, not within our membership, but there are statistically less businesses trading with the EU in Scotland than there are as the UK average. Having said that, Scotland is also particularly, um, I don't know if reliant is the right word, but free movement matters a lot um, up here. I, I live here, I know it does. Um, uh, and so there are challenges that are more acute and less acute. Where they balance and trade off, I'm not entirely sure. And to some extent, it also depends, particularly in a no-deal scenario, on um, whether the effect is is temporary. Uh, I think one of the difficult, most difficult things, we all know that generally speaking, the erection, whether voluntary or not, of trade barriers under that scenario is not good for the economy. I think everyone accepts that. What you can't predict is what mitigating actions, particularly in the medium term, unilaterally, domestically, you put in place to, to try and offset that. Okay. Um. Do you want to comment? I, I confess I'm also not an economist. Sure. I mean, I can see that there's, there seems to be also a general downturn in the world economy at the moment, which doesn't bode well, but nothing that I could add that you haven't read already. Sure. Okay, well, thank you. Um, the second area is uh, on the issue of uh, the devolved administrations, and some of this was touched upon in the, your earlier comments. Uh, obviously, in the, with the UK the document that's published in February, um, uh, just regarding the, the trade negotiations. Uh, just, I'm going to read out just a couple of lines from it. One aspect was the, the government, well, the UK government, is committed to working closely with the devolved administrations to deliver a future trade policy. Um, also, the devolved administrations will continue to be responsible for observing and implementing international obligations in areas of devolved competence. And we recognise that the devolved legislatures also have a strong and legitimate interest in future trade agreements. Now, that's quite clear, uh, certainly from a UK government perspective, in terms of the, uh, the respect um, for the, the devolved administrations. But uh, in reality, um, how is that? Uh, how do you think that's working? Um, it's obviously um, a key part of the um, negotiations on the role of devolved administrations in the areas that uh, will have been formally governed by EU law where these issues are not so great. So agriculture and um, what to do with uh, agricultural policy and how that relates to the role of devolved administrations in relation to agricultural subsidies is you know, one of the um, touchstones, I think, um, which which shows that debate. Um, it's a pretty big debate. I can't really comment on it uh, too much. What I can say is um, how this is handled in other countries which do have an independent trade policy and also um, don't have the particular overlay of EU law, which um, uh, so which would be a model for uh, a UK that's no longer in the EU when it comes to trade policy. Now, um, in general, there are areas where devolved administrations are um, one way or another at the negotiation table, sometimes even more directly and sometimes less directly. Um, why? Because even when you have, and Canada is unusual in this respect, so I wouldn't talk about Canada. It's constitutional setup is unique, really. But other federal systems, a bit more based on, say, the US model, um, the federal government has competence to deal with external affairs. So what you deal, uh, you know, how these, and Australia is the same model in the US constitution in this respect, uh, Canada is the opposite. Um, so um, the way you handle the states in this scenario is, is a little bit different. It's much more pragmatic because Theoretically, the federal government can go off and sign a treaty, and that's the end of the story, and the states have to put up with it. 
Um, in reality, what happens is that you speak to the states when you need the states in order for the agreement to be implemented, and that's because they have legislative control over certain areas. And that's where you would look at the devolution acts in this country to see what are those areas where the devolved administrations have legislative competence. Now, generally speaking, that's in areas of um, you know, non-harmonized in, in a national sense um, uh, regulation uh, and when money is involved. So procurement, I mentioned earlier, is because you know, devolved administrations or states in other federal systems, they spend money. And so you need them on board if you're going to be making commitments on procurement. It's one reason why services negotiations are much more complicated than goods negotiations, because services regulation often differs between states. I mean, imagine uh, the UK going off to negotiate access to the legal services market in the UK without paying any attention to the fact that legal services in Scotland operate under a different legal regime. You have different self-regulatory bodies arranging matters um, that deal with qualifications and so on. So there's you know, just one example of where you would need the devolved administrations to be involved um, simply to make the agreement work. And there's no point negotiating an agreement if it can't be implemented um, back at home. So to sum it up, I would say, Regardless of the formal role of devolved administrations, whether you have a seat at the table or not, the two areas where in practice devolved administrations really need to be consulted before a negotiation can effectively take place, even if formally it can, are where the devolved administrations spend money and where uh, directly or indirectly they're in control of regulation. Just to, to, to add to that, um, I, I've just pulled out the paragraph uh, that the Lord's EU Committee wrote on the Faroe Islands FTA. It said, the government's engagement with the Scottish government while negotiating these rollover agreements has been limited, and it did not share draft text with the Scottish government prior to signature. Of course, the Faroe Islands agreement is particularly relevant for fisheries, which my understanding is is devolved. So it is, to me, rather clear that uh, if you want effective devolution to work, uh, this, is, this cannot continue. And in fact, the government at least seems to have recognized it and has said it will change its policy in that regard. Uh, but what we, what we have here is also, to some extent, a constitutional arrangement that needs to develop. The constitutional arrangement is foreign affairs is a prerogative power. Uh, the UK is unusual uh, compared to other countries in that ratification procedures theoretically are just also part of the government's powers and the only processes there are is a constitutional convention that the FCO will uh, demand implementing legislation where necessary uh, to be passed before ratification takes place where implementing legislation is necessary and the CREC procedure under CREC 2010, which is a scrutiny procedure that can delay, but that doesn't give an up and down vote on the treaty. And up and down votes on trade treaties in other countries are usual. And if you have devolved powers, you would also need to, to some extent, include the devolved administrations. I think it's very important for the devolved administrations to be in, engaging with a reform discussion here, because clearly, at least to my mind, this is now something that is up for reform. Yeah, it, it, it very much is, and you, you, you obviously could be forgiven for asking the question. Obviously, there has been this commitment to, um, I don't know at what stage it will happen, and, and you all might be more informed than I, when this discussion about transfers of powers, once we're out of the EU, assuming that happens, back to developed administrations happens. Now, you would sort of expect that to happen before you go into a trade agreement um, with a third country. I don't know if that's going to be the case. I think not doing that may complicate it. Naturally, the more that, no, this isn't the tail wagging the dog, but it's just a fact that the more that you have devolved regulations, the more it complicates trade negotiations. That, that doesn't mean that you don't, you don't do the devolution, but it is a complicating factor. And obviously, everyone has now in mind um, what happened in Belgium uh, when the regional assembly was able to block that. That may, have been, that may have been great for the regional assembly or that region. It was not considered great by anyone else um, uh, around the world, really. And so there is a little bit of a fear about you know, when we talk about, um, uh, I think less so, I think the more that you involve the all administrations earlier on, regardless of how you do that, obviously there is some discussion about, um, you know, agreeing the mandate potentially, but the more you agree or discuss early on, I'd like to think that the less that that would happen at the end of the day.
I think it's an, uh, I've very much appreciated uh, three answers. And, um, certainly, uh, Dr. Herstermeyer, uh, also you may highlighted in, in paragraph 25 uh, of your submission regarding the EU Select Committee, um, highlighting this issue and the need for engagement. Uh, and well, uh, Tavish Scott and I, we were in, in, uh, in Scottish Parliament's uh, Devolution for Others Powers Committee in the last Parliament session and went through the, the whole discussion regarding the intergovernmental relations. I think, Annabelle, I think you were in the committee at the time as well. And uh, this whole problem of intergovernmental relations and having that genuine dialogue uh, has, uh, it's a perpetual problem. And, um, and I don't know if you, if you see or, or are aware of uh, of any improvements uh, that, are, that are taking place there to actually assist and help with the, the trade negotiations and the, and the trade issues uh, between, the, the, uh, between the devolved administrations and the UK government in this matter? At least from, from what, what I've seen uh, in parliamentary debate, uh, the, the government seems to have agreed that the, the procedure or the lack of engagement was uh, not okay and that they want to change this and also share draft texts. Uh, with the devolved administrations. You would expect that before any trade negotiation, which is why when you see, now part of that, as Ben has been referred to, is a gaming tactic, the US publishing its trade negotiated objectives. But it does make you wonder how quickly the UK is going to move to that. Um, and ideally, you would prefer to have a discussion about um, uh, transfers of powers before you get into that, because obviously that will complicate or um, uh, potentially infuriate, for legitimate reasons, people um, uh, in devolved administrations, because that commitment was made, um, and if you rush a trade negotiation and, and absent that completely, uh, it's, going to make, um, the, it's going to make the environment even more fraught, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. Dr. Bartos? Um, yeah. I mean, clearly this is one of those problems that arises because everything is happening all at the same time uh, for the first time. On that point. But the intergovernmental relations aspect isn't a problem that's happened because of Brexit. It's been there for some time beforehand. Of course, yeah. I mean, this is um, that's true. I mean, there are aspects of the constitutional settlement uh, which are uh, in flux, and there's an ongoing discussion there. But I think Brexit has, uh, in the area of trade, um, really uh, uh, raised this to to another level, um, and I think. Um, it, it would obviously be useful to see how other countries have dealt with uh, similar sorts of situations. Of course, each situation is a little bit different from, from others, but one can try to get a sense of um, what sorts of matters um, a devolved administration would have a more legitimate claim to have a say in uh, and, and what not. For instance, a, a, an example that came up earlier in our discussion was the effect of um, no deal dropping of tariffs to zero on a particular business. Now, I have to say, to my mind, and I hope um, it's all right to say this, that strikes me as just a national issue. I don't see that that's a devolved issue because that's just a business in the UK and there is you know, formal representation um, uh, via um, UK Parliament for those sorts of issues. That seems to me to be different from the sorts of issues where, according to the constitutional settlement, uh, devolved administrations um, have a particular role. And I think it would be, um, uh, you know, uh, helpful probably to to focus on uh, on the uh, problem from that point of view. What is actually legitimately claimed and what is not. Thank you very much. Just, just quickly to, to follow up on that, the committee's uh, own advisor, Dr. Filippo Fontanelli, um, in his, his briefing for us, points out that areas of devolved competency that are affected by trade agreements, and they are extensive rules on public procurement, rules on trade in agriculture and fisheries products, geographic indicators, as we've discussed, environmental protection, sustainable fisheries, forestries, judicial cooperation against corruption and money laundering, civil justice, um, a huge array of devolved competencies. Now, we've talked about intergovernmental relations, but we know that in trade agreements, the EU Parliament has a formal role at the moment. We're now replacing that. So what kind of role should this Parliament have, given that these devolved competencies are so extensive in the, the way they impact on 
trade agreements in Scotland's interests? And just follow up. It, it, it's a direct um, uh, follow up from uh, what I was saying previously. It depends on how you look at it. I mean, if the thing about trade agreements is that they affect absolutely everything. All right. So I don't think that. Um, or rather, let's put it a little bit more neutrally, if your test is what does this agreement affect, then you would have the Scottish government negotiating trade agreements on its own because the effect of a trade agreement is, uh, is everything. I mean, trade can cover absolutely everything every time you pull out your wallet. Um, a trade agreement is implicated in some way because you're buying goods or services that will have some international component. So that's a very, very broad test. Um, I think um, if you look at the experience of other countries, they don't apply that test. And that's why I am more conservative. And I think um, it's when the, uh, you know, my uh, approach would be to look at not what areas are you know, where there's a common effect of a trade agreement and an effect in terms of what the Scottish government might regulate, because that would cover everything, but rather um, where does the trade agreement more directly affect the regulatory powers um, of the Scottish government uh, or Scottish parliament um, uh, in the devolved uh, settlement? And I think that's narrower. I think in terms of the, uh, uh, what can be done, uh, there, there are a lot of models, of course, to consider from every single federal country that had to find its own settlement of how they deal with these negotiations to the EU itself, which consists of member states that also have a voice and where the, the, the outcome was often mixed agreements uh, in which member states also become parties. Um, the types of solution you can envisage range from just overriding devolution altogether through the trade agreement and saying these are, as soon as there's a trade agreement, this becomes a central competence and also the implementation is done through the center, which is uh, not very good for any devolution model, uh, to having a seat at the table, which complicates negotiations quite a lot. Uh, what is discussed currently in the reform debate on how to change parliamentary involvement in treaty arrangements are several points of entry, if you want, a point of entry concerning the mandate of the negotiation um, and an up and down vote on the deal itself at the end. You can't really have parliament amend it because then you have to go back to the negotiation table and that's a real pain. So the discussion is more an up and down vote and then rights of information that have been consulted. And now you it, it seems to me reasonable rather than giving devolved administrations a seat at a table and complicating it to run this through the devolved administrations by establishing also a requirement to consult and why not, to some extent, also a requirement to get agreement from devolved administrations when you're negotiating their, in their competences. Uh, I think this, this will need to be discussed in depth and what really makes these discussions more difficult is that there are all of these rollover agreements which pretend to be old agreements so uh, to some extent, there is an argument of saying we don't really need the same type of involvement there. But I think that shouldn't diminish that there's the need to have a good debate. And one thing to learn also from the uh, EU experiences, it is then vitally important for the devolved administrations to also have the relevant experts. Because one of the things that I think people found annoying in, in the CETA story was that a lot of experts in the area of investor state dispute settlement had the feeling these are not always legitimate concerns, but to some extent people reading these agreements from, for the first time and suddenly getting a feeling of shock rather than reading them early on and getting that shock early on and being able to be informed. I, I think I would probably follow um, the slightly more conservative approach favoured by Lauren, but that, me, that is, I think, uh, everyone was very, in the trade policy community, affected by the, the Wallonians' experience. And that has probably soured a lot of people's approach to um, thinking it's a good idea to have um, uh, devolved administrations to, subject to constitutional requirements having an actual vote at the end of the process, which is why I think it's so much more important, even if it is potentially, um, uh, you know, um, a sort of a vote on the mandate. I think the mandate is a better place to start than focus on the end point. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming to give evidence to us today. And we shall now move into private session.